So, gentlemen, good morning to you all. Uh, this morning, I'd like to take you on a tour of the grass market. But first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about the general background history. I'll start off with some geology. And uh, this is a, a drawing of what Edinburgh may have looked like about 1460. And of course, in the center here, we have uh, Edinburgh Castle with David's Tower sitting on its rock. Now, the rock is a plug of an extinct volcano, which last erupted about 320 million years ago. But when it erupted, it was not here at 56 degrees north. It was on the equator, sitting on its tectonic plate. It then floated northwards until about 100 million years ago, it was at the latitude of today's North Africa. There it sank to the bottom of a, a sea and sediment is laid down on top. Continued to come northwards by two million years ago, it was here, 56 north. This is the time of the Ice Age. Now the glaciers then were moving from the west to the east in this direction. Uh, the ice could scour away the relatively soft sedimentary rock, but when it came to this dolerite plug, it couldn't move that. So the only way to get past was to gouge down into the ground. So it gouged out the valley to the north, and the Norlock is shown on it in this drawing, but it's today's Princess Street Gardens, and another valley to the south with the grass market here and the cow gate, which still exists. And uh, the sedimentary rock in the, the castle, in, sorry, the sedimentary rock in the shadow of the castle was allowed to survive to a greater elevation than the, the ground round about it. And this created the typical crag and teal formation and it gives the slope of the Royal Mile we have today. <clears throat> now, if this is how the grass market was created, when was it first occupied? Well, the oldest evidence of human occupation in the Edinburgh area was found in Arthur's seat when Flint dating back to about 2000 BC was discovered. There is evidence of prehistoric occupation on the Castle Rock, and of course, the occupation of the rock by the local Votedini tribe in uh, Roman times is well documented. But there was nothing to show that anyone lived at ground level. Until 2011, some archaeologists were excavating outside the beehive and they discovered soil, which to them was evidence of, of human interference. This was radiocarbon dated in Florida to be between 1500 and 1300 BC. And uh, until then, it was thought that the, the first occupation <coughs> at ground level in the grass market area was about the 12th century. So it's going back a huge amount. So when did the markets first come? Well, in 1477, King James III of Scotland um, established some 15 markets in the Edinburgh area. And the grass market was allocated three of those. Second-hand goods were sold in front of Greyfriars Monastery, which is just off the photograph here. <coughs> Timber was sold in the market and livestock was sold at the West End, which is where this building is at the moment. By 1500, the grass market was pretty much in its present contours. It's about 230 yards long. In 1543, it was paved and you can see some paving on, on this drawing. In 1600, uh, the emphasis has changed to be a, a horse and a cattle market. And this is where the grass market took its name, because obviously for all these animals, there had to be grass and hay and straw uh, available for them. <coughs> 15, sorry, 1670, the emphasis changed again, and now the traders decided it was a better idea merely to park their carts in the grass market and carry the goods up the bow and sell them in the lawn market in the high street. And over the next 200 years or so, the number of carters increased considerably. And then by the middle of the 18th century into the, sorry, middle of the 19th into the 20th century, the grass market and most of the old town had actually become a slum. But now late 20th, early 21st century, it's becoming very much up market again. And it's a very popular tourist uh, destination. Corn markets played a huge part in the history of the grass market, but the corn market didn't arrive here until 1716. Until then, it occupied, it was sold, corn was sold from the meal market, and that occupied several different sites in the high street and uh, in the cowgate. 
So I came here in 1716, went to the West End in 1814, and this building here is in fact the West End car market. And then in 1849, it moved to the South Side, we'll see that later, and in 1910, completely out of town and off to Gorgie. Now, just to start our, our little tour, this is the Grand Mar Grass Market today. This is the Grass Market area here. For those of you not too familiar with the layout, this is Princess Street in, in this line here. The castle here, Esplanade set up for the military tattoo, Johnson Terrace, which takes us to the Lawn Market and the top of the Royal Mile. Uh, this is the, the West Bow. The original line of the bow came up in this direction and went up to the Lawn Market. It's very, very steep. And there are a flight of steps in here to get you up to the top. The modern road, of course, is Victoria Street and that takes you along here and into George Bond Bridge. And this is Candlemaker Road. Greyfars Kirk, which plays a huge part in the history of the grass market is off map just down here. And George Heriot School, if any Heriotters watching, um, is just off map about here. So we're going to start our tour at the, the east end of the grass market, about here. We'll walk along here. You'll be happy to know we're going to have a pub crawl along here. A little digression into Castle Wine, another one into King Stables Road. Pass to the south side on the line of the flood wall, all the way back on the south side to our starting point. So let's go. Uh, this kind of architect's drawing is of the first corn market, which came here in 1716. It was originally an open air market, but that's not a good idea, as you'll know, in Edinburgh. So this shed was built, it's 42 feet by 24 feet. The market was open on Thursdays and the bells of Grey Friars would ring at 11 o'clock to herald the opening, and uh, it closed again at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. So it, it, it didn't last very long, only once a week. Beside the market, we have the old Bowfoot Well, and that's uh, our next one. This is the Bowfoot Well today, built in 1674. Now, prior to the middle of the 17th century, Edinburgh took its drinking water from the Borough Loch, which is the site of the meadows today. But that was drained at the middle of the 17th century. So another source of water had to be found. And this was the, uh, the springs at Comiston. So water was piped by gravity from the springs at Comiston to a reservoir, which you can still see at the top of Castle Hill. And then from that reservoir, it was uh, fed again by gravity to uh, around 12 wells uh, in the old town. And the one at the foot of the, the, the bow is the first well to take the, the water from the, the, the reservoir at the top of Castle Hill. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the building at the back here, the white one is our next object. Uh, you can just see the, the, the well there beside the police box. This building is the oldest existing building in the grass market. It dates to 1616. And uh, of course, in that date, uh, a building built of stone would be the latest, very luxurious, when everything else was still timber with thatched roofs. And this is built on uh, ground belonging to the Knights Templar. Now, we'll start a pub crawl here with Maggie Dixon. Who was Maggie Dixon? Well, I'll take you back to the year 1724. Maggie Dixon was a fisherwoman from Musselburgh, and uh, after her, her husband was press ganged into the Navy, she was a naughty girl and became pregnant by another man. Now, the, there was an act of 1690, the Concealment of Pregnancy Act, which well, obviously you're not allowed to conceal pregnancy. And if you did, the sentence was death. So Maggie obviously tried to, to hide her pre pregnancy, but the baby was still born, so she was discovered. She was tried under the act, found guilty and sentenced to hang in the grass market. Now, on the day, the execution went well, if you can see that. The executioner pulled on her legs to make sure that her neck was broken and all seemed to have gone well. The family was there to cut her down. They put her into a coffin, nailed the lid on the coffin, hoisted it up onto a cart and set off home for Musselburgh. On the way, they were accosted by a group of apprentice surgeons who wanted the body for anatomy practice. A scuffle broke out. The coffin came off the cart the lid came off, air got in, and Maggie revived. She was not dead at all. 
She was taken back to Musselburgh where she was given the, uh, an 18th century version of a wee cup of tea and she completely revived. She lived for another 29 years at least, had several more children, and uh, from then on she was known as Half Hang It Maggie. Half Hang It Maggie. <laughs> Uh, our next one is the last drop. Now, this is not about the last drop of beer in your glass. This is all about the last. Okay. <laughs> Alex, I hope you guys are not too clean. Uh, this is the last drop of the gallows because uh, in this direction over here is the site of the public gallows. Uh, Executions came to this site from 1660 and they lasted until 1784. Before then, executions had been by the axe or by the sword on Castle Hill or at the Market Cross. And this, you will quite appreciate, was rather messy. So uh, they tried to, to clear things up. The nobility, of course, were still entitled to be beheaded. That, that was one of their perks. And uh, they, they no longer had to face a sword though, because the maiden had been introduced. This is the beheading machine. And that was used in various sites, but mostly at the Tollbooth. <clears throat> so executions from 1616 to 1784. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the East End corn market. And you can see that lots of people sitting on the roof uh, to watch the execution. And all the windows are, are, are full of people because no cinema, no, no TV, etc. An execution was entertainment uh, for the people. Now, the site of the, the, um, the gallows today is marked by the Covenanters Memorial. Uh, this is a memorial. It's not, not terribly impressive, I don't think. This bit here used to have the socket for, for the gibbet. And we've just laid the gibbet out uh, in stone on, on the slabs. And there's a wee pigeon here to give you an idea of the scale. So the Covenanters Memorial, who were the Covenanters? Well, they had, they had their flag and they were the mostly men, but probably women as well, who supported the National Covenant of 1638. And they fought for the right to worship as Presbyterians against the monarchy, which wanted the Scottish Kirk to be Episcopal or, or even Roman Catholic. Um, it all started in 1560 uh, with the Treaty of Edinburgh. The Treaty of Edinburgh ended the siege of Leith when the Lords of the Congregation and Elizabeth I of England's army finally managed to evict Mary of Guise from Leith. Amongst other things, the Treaty of Edinburgh stated that Scotland was to be an independent Protestant country. And here lies the problem, because the people wanted the Protestant religion to be Presbyterian, whereas the monarchy wanted the Protestant religion to be Episcopal, or even uh, go back to Roman Catholicism. But this was a, quite a milestone in Scottish history, because it changed the de facto religion of Scotland from Roman Catholic to Protestant. Now let's have a look at how it developed. Mary Queen of Scots came back from France in 1561 and uh, in 1567 she was forced to abdicate. She was, and when Mary was in Scotland she tried to make the religion again Roman Catholic. She was succeeded on her abdication by her son James VI who was only one year old at the time and he was therefore guided by four regents. Uh, Murray Lennox, Marr and Morton, and uh, James wanted the Scottish Kirk to be Episcopal, but he, he wasn't able to implement it. As a young boy, he didn't have the clout to do it. He died 1625, succeeded by Charles I. Now, Charles tried to force Episcopacy on the Scottish Kirk, and things came to a head in 1637. Now, I'm sure this is a, an incident you will all remember from your school days. This is when Jenny Geddes threw her stool at the minister in St Giles when he dared to use Archbishop Lord of Canterbury's common book of prayer. And this gave rise the next year, 1638, to the signing of the National Covenant, a rejection of the Episcopal service in the Scottish Kirk. <coughs> The National Covenant was signed in Great First Kirk. Uh, it was signed in the Kirk, not in the Kirkyard. And if you look at the bottom of the pulpit here, there's a wee bit of wording here. It says, 
Here was signed the National Covenant of 1638. And uh, this is the covenant, the top corner of the covenant itself. Parliament accepted the National Covenant in 1640. And by the, another covenant, the, the, the Solemn League government, they promised to establish uh, the Presbytery in the Scottish Kirk. Now, Charles I was executed in 1649 and succeeded by Charles II. Now, the Scots were more than happy to accept Charles as their monarch, but they refused, they refused to give him a coronation unless he signed the two covenants. Charles was desperate for a coronation, so he signed the two covenants. We then have the 10 years uh, of the Commonwealth where Oliver Cromwell was pretty much in charge. The restoration comes along in 1660. Charles is restored with no intention whatsoever of honoring the two covenants which he signed in 1649. He then established a revised form of episcopacy in the Kirk, but still with bishops. This was too much for the ministers and the elders. So they walked out and they started to preach at open air services called conventicles. They were immediately made illegal by the government and the dragoons would come along and try and break up the meetings. So the Presbyterians fought back. They were the covenanters. They fought back against uh, the government. One very important battle, the Battle of Bothwell Brig in 1679, a huge government victory where some 1,200 prisoners were uh, taken. And these prisoners were kept in what was at that time a field beside the Greyfriars Kirkyard. The field today is now part of the Kirkyard and this is a shot taken through the iron railings. It's known as the Covenanters Prison. So we have 1,200 Covenanters uh, kept here in the open air, no shelter. The man responsible for their, their, um, what happened to them was George Mackenzie of Rose Hall. And if I tell you that his nickname was Bloody Mackenzie, you'll get a good idea of what happened to the poor prisoners. Many of them merely died of exposure. Many were deported to uh, probably Canada and New Zealand, and a huge number were executed, about 100 or so, uh, in the grass market. Uh, Charles II died 1685 and he was succeeded by his brother, James VII, and James tried to make the Scottish Kirk Roman Catholic again. So we're bouncing from one religion to another. And then in 1689, uh, his son-in-law, William III, came along and finally forced um, James VII to flee. And this is a period of history called the Glorious Revolution. Uh, but you'll notice that it's now taken 128 years from the point that Scotland was to be uh, a Presbyterian Kirk to it actually happening. Beside the, the Covenanters Memorial is a stainless steel plaque which gives the name of around 100 of, of these Covenanters. The first one here, 1661, the Marcus of Argyll, the last one, 1685, the Earl of Argyll. And because you, you guys are from Bowness, we've got William Gilgan of Bowness is also on uh, the, the, the plaque. Now, I don't know if there'd be any Gilgans left living in Bowness. You, 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 you lads may know about that, but if there is, uh, here's a bit of history for him. This is the first Marquis. Um, Presbyterians, particularly the churchmen, don't have a very good reputation, and he's kind of dour and uh, a fun loving lad. <laughs> First Marquis of Argyll, Archibald Campbell. Now let's leave um, the, the Presbyterians for a moment. If we take a, a, a wee shortcut up Castle Wind, we find the ruins of the first Gallic chapel to be built in Edinburgh. Uh, this was very welcome because there were hundreds of Highlanders in town at the time and they were very happy to be able to worship in their own Gallic language. The first minister was the Reverend Joseph Robertson McGregor. But of course, at this time, the McGregor name had been prescribed by the government. So um, Joseph used his mother's maiden name of Robertson uh, when he was minister. And when prescription was lifted in 1787, he very quickly 
found himself a, a complete tartan, of, a complete outfit of McGregor tartan and uh, paraded conspicuously about the town. Our next one is the White Hart. Now the White Hart is arguably the oldest pub in Edinburgh, established 1516, but there are others which will dispute that, such as the Sheepheed at Duddingston is probably even older, but is it in Edinburgh? That's the question. Now the White Hart has, has seen quite a number of famous people uh, visit in its time. Robert Burns was here in 1691. The um, Wordsworth siblings, William and Dorothy, visit, Dorothy visited but without doubt, the most famous, or I should say notorious visitors here were our famous Birkin Hare, uh, or Hare and Birkin, in, uh, Hare and Birkin, this one. Now, Birkin Hare were both born in Ireland in the 1790s. They met in Edinburgh in 1818 when they were both working on the, the Union Canal. And when the canal was finished in 1822, uh, they both became down and outs. <coughs> Here um, fell on his feet when fell on his feet. That's not landed on his feet when he met a lady called Margaret Log, whose husband owned a, a lodging house in Tanners Close, which is in the the West Port on the site of Argyle House today. And uh, when Mr. Log died, William here married Margaret Log and inherited the lodging house. Burke, in the meantime, met a. I hesitate to say lady, a woman called it Mary McDougall. Now, this is the lodging house, uh, Logs Lodging in Tanners Close. And Birkenhair's crime, life of crime started when one morning they found an old lodger had died in his sleep without having paid his rent. He was pretty angry about this. So to make up for the rent, they sold the body to the notorious Dr. Robert Knox for seven pounds, 10 shillings. Robert Knox ran an anatomy school and was always uh, wanting bodies for his students, no questions asked. So they realized that this is a very easy way to raise money, much better than having to dig bodies up. So they then proceeded to uh, identify likely uh, victims, waifs and strays, people who had never been mi missed, lure them back to in such as the White Heart, feed them on rock gut whiskey, and when they were drunk, take them back to the lodgings uh, in Tanner's Close. There they, they murdered them, usually by suffocation with a pillow or, or Burke holding his hand uh, over the mouth and pinching the nose. Um, the, the, the last victim was a lady called Mary Doherty, and Mary Doherty was conned into believing that she was a relative of Burke and she was invited to stay in the lodgings at no charge. But to make this possible, uh, Birkin here had to persuade a Mr. and Mrs. Gray to vacate a room. The Grays were very suspicious, but they vacated the room uh, and allowed uh, Mrs. Docker to, to stay there. They came back the next morning, however, because they were so suspicious, and true enough, they found the body under straw. It had, she had been suffocated. They informed the police, but the police couldn't prove anything. And they then hit on the idea of persuading William Hare to become an informer. Hare did so. And uh, at the trial on Christmas Eve, 1827, Burke and Hare were found guilty of murder. They had between nine months in 1827, they had murdered between 16 and 30 people by suffocating them in, in Long's lodgings. Here, of course, being an informer was allowed to go free, and the two women were also allowed to go free. But some 25,000 people came to watch Burke's execution on the 28th of January, 1828. And this is on the, the uh, lawn market, just at the top of what is now um, George Vaud Bridge. And again, you can see all the windows are, are full of people uh, watching the, <coughs> the execution. Now, the judge also said that after the execution, Burke's body should have a public dissection, quite a comeuppance for, for a guy like this. And uh, after the dissection, his skeleton was preserved. And we can see that in the, um, the museum in Teviot Row in Edinburgh beside the university. His skin was made into a pocketbook 
and that can still be seen. There used to be a little police museum in the High Street, and I, I saw that book uh, in the bookcase there, but the museum's closed now, and I'm not really sure where the book's gone to, but, but quite, quite bloodthirsty. Uh, oops. Uh, it looks like, like skin with all the pores on it. So if you get into the museum, you will see Burke's skeleton and perhaps this pocketbook as well. Now, there's a plaque on the ground indicating that um, in 1916, a bomb fell from airship L-14. And uh, this is just a photograph of the crowd looking at the damage uh, carried out by the bomb. Our next pub is the Beehive. Now, the Beehive on the first floor has a room with the door from the condemned cell of the Colton Jail, which was uh, just, uh, knocked down in 1937. And on the second floor, there's a room where Prince Charles used to have lunch when he was in the Navy stationed at Rosyth. But perhaps the most interesting one is that in rooms above the Beehive, lived a gentleman called Ebenezer Lennox Scroggy. He was born in Kirkcaldy in 1792. He was a corn merchant and the winter by change, by trade rather. And when he died in, 19, in 17, sorry, 1832, he was buried in the Canongate Kirk. Now in 1841, Charles Dickens, the author, was in Edinburgh giving a lecture tour and on some spare time, he wandered into the Canongate Kirk just for a look around and probably literally stumbled over Scroggy's gravestone. Now, his eyesight wasn't particularly good or he'd been drinking port already because he misread the gravestone as Ebenezer Scrooge, mean man, where it actually said Ebenezer Scroggy, meal man. And this then gave uh, Dickens his inspiration for uh, our famous Christmas Carol character of Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, this is where we take a, a little detour up the King Stables Road. Um, you come to a flight of steps called the Barris Steps, and this is the multi-story car park, uh, which you access from Castle Terrace on, on the top here. What's the name Barris? This was quite an interesting name. Well, Barris actually, um, is a corruption of the Barres, which was a tilting ground laid out in this site, built by, in 1335, by the soldiers of Edward III, who was occupying Edinburgh Castle at the time. And I think you'll see, if I go back to this one, that that's the French word, les bar, for the, the, the barriers which define the list. And you can just see that the Scots, who are masters at mangling foreign words, we call this Barris, Barris, and the steps took, have taken the name from there, Barris Steps. The King's Table Road was the, if you go in this direction, it's the road to Queen's Ferry and St Cuthbert's Kirk, but if you come in this direction, it's the road to the King's Tables. Again, um, built in 1335, by Edward III soldiers, and the stables were in this area here. There's no trace whatsoever now of the stables. Uh, this is the east, so the West End Corn Market, which was here from 1814 until 1849. The building was fine to me, but all sorts of reports say it was very ugly and, and, and not very nice at all. So demolished in 1849. Now the Flodden Wall, um, comes down from the castle here and it crosses the west end of the, the, the grass market. Now, although this name is named after the Battle of Flodden of 1513, it was actually built sometime between 1477 and 1507. And it was mainly strengthened uh, after the Battle of Flodden when the, the Scots army, having been annihilated by the English army, were then a bit wary of an English invasion. So they then went around strengthening all the walls which already surrounded um, the old town of Edinburgh. The line of the Flodden Wall comes down from the castle. We can't quite identify where it starts, but it comes down the east end of these steps. Are, this is Granny's Green, and these steps are called Granny's Green Steps. So it comes down the east end, crosses, oh, here's a better one, comes down the east end of the steps, 
crosses the west end of the grass market and then comes up the east end of the venal. And this is the venal looked like in 1867. And now flight of steps here rather than just a track. And it meets the later 1828 Telfer wall at the top of the venal steps. See the castle in the background here. Now, this is a, a, another drawing by Mir, and I'm using this off the grass market to, to look at the West Port. The West Port is, is uh, one of the gateways in the Flodden Wall, which you can see here. And I've never been able to find any drawing or illustration whatsoever of the West Port. So I have to assume it's no more than an arch, but nevertheless, it was one of the main entrances into the town. And a number of famous people have come into Edinburgh through, through this gateway. In 1503, James IV and his bride Margaret Tudor came in. They were on their way uh, to visit the Greyfriars Monastery. In 1538, Mary of Guise, Mary Queen of Scots' mother, made her first Edinburgh to Edinburgh, her first visit to Edinburgh. In 1579, James VI, aged 12, 13, this was the age he attained majority. He came into town officially for the first time, and in 1590, his bride Anne of Denmark came in uh, through this way. 1633, Charles I made his first and only visit to the town. Now, because this is a very important and, and public place, uh, it was used uh, by the authorities for pub publicity. If there was an execution, the authorities wanted to make as much use as possible as they could of the body. And the head, of course, is far too valuable an object to, uh, to lose. So as the French said, pour encourager les autres, heads were spiked on gate doorways such as the West Port, such as the Nether Pub Port, and in buildings uh, such as the Tollbooth. Heads spiked at the West Port in 1487, Robert Graham, the assassin of King James I. In 1515, a poor lad called Peter Muffet, uh, there had been some sort of uh, commotion in the grass market and the authorities felt that an object lesson should be made. So the dry poor Peter, whose greatest sin was he swore too much. Um, mm -hmm. He was dried out, had his head chopped off and that was spiked. In 1665, uh, there were three covenanting heads here. Two of them were taken away probably for legitimate uh, burial by the family. And again, the authorities thought this is not on. So another two poor guys were dragged out of prison, uh, had their heads chopped off, and they made the triumvirate of three heads. Not only heads though, in 1691, the right hand of John Cheesley of the Rye was cut off and spiked here. Cheesley uh, was found guilty of murdering Sir George Locker, the Lord President of the Court of Session in the old uh, bank close. And uh, before his execution, his right hand was chopped off and spiked on the gate. The pistol which he used to uh, shoot Sir George Locker was then hung around his neck when he was hanged. The body disappeared after two or three days. This one wasn't cut down. It just disappeared after two or three days. And then somewhere about 1930, some builders were working on some old cottages in Dalry, um, Dalry Park. I'm not sure where Dalry Park is. I think it's all been built up now by, by the tenements. But they found uh, behind a fireplace, a skeleton with a pistol hanging around his neck. Is it, has to be um, John Cheesley. Uh, this is a, probably a Victorian photograph of the, the West Port. The gateway was probably somewhere here, and the street itself is also called the West Port. So the gate is the West Port, and the street is called the West Port. This is the 1849 corn market. Um, the market lasted until, until 1910, but the building itself lasted much longer. This was custom built for a corn market, so had meeting rooms and stalls and everything the merchant would require. It also saw, had some very big rooms and they were used for various banquets. In 1856, the soldiers who came back from Crimea were 
year. And then, oops, uh, in 1857, the soldiers who fought in the Indian Mutiny returned to the UK and to Scotland, and they were given a banquet in the corn market. Now, a wee street called Harriet Bridge. At the top here, you can see the dome of George Harriet School. Until 1828, this little roadway was the route to the front door of George Harriet School. But in that year, the front door was moved round the back to Lauriston, just opposite the old Royal Infirmary. And this became a cul-de-sac. But why is it called Herrick Bridge? There's no river here. There's no sort of chasm. There's nothing to cross. A bit of a mystery until you find it. Here is the Herrick Bridge. There's the dome of George Herrick School. And the bridge was mainly used to ease the gradient from the grass market up to the front door of Harriet's school. Uh, this bridge makes the gradient look even steeper than it really is. The drawing makes it look even steeper. But uh, as you can see from the little description here, um, it was removed in the 1760s because it was obstructing the thoroughfare. Uh, these buildings here were known as the Templar, the Templar buildings, Temple lands, and it was in front of, of this building that Captain John Porteous was strung up in 1736. This is the start of the Porteous riots. Now, this is a plaque on the east wall of Hunter Close, which is the nearest point to the, the lynching that the authority, that, you know, and the modern authorities could make. The actual site is between number 85 and 83, Grass Market. What's the Porteous Riot about? Well, in 1736, two notorious five smugglers, um, George Robertson and Andrew Wilson, made a revenge attack on the Commission of Customs at Pitt and Wien in Fife and robbed them of 200 pounds. A third man involved in this became an informer. Robertson and Wilson were found, arrested, tried and sentenced to hang uh, because of the, the, the attack on the Commission of Customs. And on the last Sunday before their execution, they were taken under guard to a service at St Giles. On the way there, Wilson managed to break free from the guards who were holding him and he shouted at George Robertson to run. Robertson broke free from his guard, headed for the crowd. The crowd obviously opened up to let him in. He disappeared into the closest and he was never found again. Wilson was then left to face the execution alone. On the day of the execution, the authorities suspected that there may be some trouble. So they ordered a, a, a continued of the town guard under the leadership of Captain John Porteous to attend the execution. The execution again by all intents and purposes seemed to go well but after it was complete the crowd became uneasy and uh, Porteous who was drunk and they treated uh, Wilson rather roughly uh, fired his musket at the crowd. The crowd responded by pelting him with dung and stones and all the rubbish they could find and Porteous then ordered his town guard to fire at them. Nine were killed and 20 were wounded. By the, even by the standards of 1736, this was too much. So Porches was arrested and imprisoned in the Talbot. He was then tried, found guilty and sentenced to hang. He was, the crowd gathered to watch his execution, but just before he was pushed off the ladder, word came that he, that he had been pardoned by Queen Caroline who was the acting as regent for King George II. So Porteous was taken back, put into the toll booth, and the gallows were uh, taken down again. Now that night, some of the guy, some of the people who were not too happy about this um, of Porteous getting off, broke into the toll booth. They dragged Porteous out, marched them up the high street, up the lawn market, and down the bow. And on the way down, they broke into a rope maker shop, took a length of rope, which you can probably see in the hand here, and left the guinea on the counter to pay for it. When they got to the bottom 
of the the bow very uh, helpfully there was a dyer's pole on the building just opposite so porches were strung up from on the dyer's pole uh, and this was lynch law and it, it set off a, a, a riot called the Porches Riots. This is a painting by James Drummond uh, of the riots. When the authorities tried to investigate what had happened, they could only name six of the ringleaders and surprise, surprise, they could not be found anywhere. They had obviously uh, completely disappeared. At the end of the day, the Lord Provost was deposed and uh, forbidden from taking any sort of office again. The town council was suspended and the town was fined £2,000 uh, because of, of all the, the, the bad governments on it. Now we're just about back uh, to the east end of the grass market. But first, a little story about Greyfriars Monastery. There is no site whatsoever of the monastery at ground level. But from this map, we can see just where it is. This is Candlemaker Row coming up to Orge Greyfriar. The monastery was established sometime in the early 15th century by King James I of Scotland. The friars who manned it were from uh, the continent and they found by their standards the monastery so comfortable that they refused to come here until they were per persuaded to do so by the Archbishop of St Andrews and they taught um, philosophy and divinity. Of the people who visited the monastery, um, James IV and Margaret Tudor who came in through the West Port which is long here, they visited the monastery <coughs> In uh, 1516, uh, King Henry, this, sorry, I've got my date wrong here. I'll go back again. In 1449, Mary of Gilders, uh, the wife of King James II of Scotland, spent some time here before her marriage. In 1461, King Henry VI of England was given sanctuary here after his defeat at the Battle of Towton in the Wars of the Roses. And then in 1503, I started at the wrong end of the list here, in 1503, James IV and Margaret Tudor uh, visited the monastery. In 1559, it was completely destroyed by the Earl of Argyle and the Lords of the Congregation, who were in town trying to evict Mary of Guise from Leith. And then in, in 1562, the garden of the monastery, which is up here below, was gifted to the, to the town to, to be used as a graveyard for Grey Friars. So Grey Friars Kirkyard is a council graveyard. It doesn't belong to the Kirk at all. And all the stones of the monastery um, were used for various walls and other buildings in the town. And finally, our last building here, uh, the Kunzi House. The Kunzi is a Scots word for the mint, the Royal Mint, and uh, this was the, the Royal Mint in Scotland from the birth of Mary Queen of Scots, so of course she born in Lithgow, very close to where you are, uh, in 1542, until the death of her mother, Mary of Guise, in, in 1560. And uh, this is where um, all, the, all the, the money was made. And there we are, you know, our gentlemen.